In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful. Amen. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. O oh God, whom by the light of the Holy Spirit instructed the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and always rejoice in God's favors through Christ our Lord. Spirit of light. Spirit of light. Spirit of light. Spirit of the living God. Spirit of the Most High God. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Father and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today's gospel reading for today's Mass is Matthew chapter 24, 42 to 51. So we shall use the reading for the day for our talk for today. And let's see what God is saying to us. Matthew 24. 42 to 51. Praise the Lord. Last week, Thursday, we took the reading for that particular Thursday. And the reading we took was about the wedding banquet. And the man who walked into the wedding feast, though invited, but did not have a wedding garment. We talked about the need to be ready and be properly dressed in the robe of righteousness that we may be able to sit at the banquet eternal of the Lord. That even though we've been invited, Certain things are required of us. Readiness. Putting on the correct garments. That will make us acceptable. We should not come in odd, out of place. That was last week. And we know that the banquet that we were being called to that last week is the everlasting banquet in the kingdom of our Father when life's journey is over that you may be found able to sit at that table in the place that God, Jesus, has gone to prepare for us. It is interesting, therefore, to me to note that another Thursday comes and the reading is Matthew 24, 42 to 51. The reading for the Mass of the day, not that as if I'm looking for readings to do with eternal life all the time. So as you say, oh, why can't mommy tell us something else? The readings are just coming on their own. I didn't select them. This is the reading for today. Again, he is talking about the master coming at an hour we do not expect. That was what happened last week. That unwise fellow sat there. I keep asking myself, did he not look around to see that others were wearing something different? and that he was the only one not wearing what others had on them? Did he not notice that he was the odd man? Why did he not do something before the king came out to throw him out? Why did he not make the necessary adjustments to fit into the society in which he found himself, into the, into the, into the beautiful banquet table, feast, was he blind? We were not told he was a blind man. He ought to have noticed that there is a particular wedding garment that everybody wore and that he was not wearing it. So that he even asked, where do I get it from? Did you get your own? Let me go and get, if nothing else. He adamantly sat there until the king that set the banquet came, saw him absolutely out of place with the expected code of dressing for that banquet and threw him out. Many of us are like that. We know the right thing to do. We will not do it. And even when we see others 
hurrying to do the right thing, we just remain unconcerned because we think we can get away with anything. Then the king comes unexpectedly and throws you out. Today's reading, again, there comes the servant whom the master trusted so much and put him in charge of the entire household and all the other servants to give them their food at the appropriate time. And the Lord tells us, Happy their servants will be if his master's arrival finds him at his duty post. I tell you solemnly, he will place him over everything he owns. But as for the dishonest servant, who says to himself, my master is taking his time, and sets about beating his fellow servants, eating and drinking with drunkards, his master will come on a day he does not expect, and at an hour he does not know. The master will cut him off, Send him to the same fate as the hypocrites. Yet yeah, there will be weeping and grinding of teeth. These same words we heard last week. How the master, the king that said the banquet, told them to bundle that fellow out who was not properly dressed. And to throw him into the outer darkness. Yet yeah, there will be weeping and grinding of teeth. Again, another weeping and grinding of teeth. Somebody will be sent there. This time around, not because he was not wearing wedding garments, but because he was not found doing what he should be doing at the right time. He took advantage of the master's absence and began to do whatever he liked. Today's case is a case of negligence of duty. Today's case is a case of presumption. The master is taking his time. He will not come back now. Today's case is a case of procrastinating the right thing to do. Today's case is a case of the wicked servant. Today's case is a case of the laser fair attitude, which some of us have. Today's case is a case of taking the master's goodness and favors for granted. It is a case of not knowing who you are. And what, what I, I always say to some people, you don't know your weight in gold. You don't know your value. Here you are. Of all people, your master chooses you to be in charge of his entire household, giving you the authority, the key, the power to look after everybody else, free to go and take food, give them what they need at the appropriate time. And what did you bring yourself to? You brought yourself down to the level of a tyrant, The level of a drunkard, you brought yourself down to the level of the untrustworthy. It's a case of betrayal of trust. A case of betrayal of trust. And so without having to say too much, I would like all of us to examine ourselves and see what kind of a servant am I? Am I that servant to whom the Lord has entrusted so much and I'm just using what he entrusted me with to do what I like, eating, drinking, getting drunk, overeating, turn it into enjoyment spree for myself while others are suffering. Let's examine ourselves and see, am I that servant whom the Lord Jesus trusts so much as to choose and call, believing that I will do well and glorify Him, and instead 
my life is just not glorifying God. Let's examine ourselves and see where do I belong. Am I that good servant, however, on the other hand, whom the master will come and be so happy with me and meet me doing exactly what he has told me to do, taking good care of everything he has entrusted to me, and he will now give me and put me in charge of everything that he has. That's a very big one, the Bible tells us. Happy that servant, if his master's arrival finds him as his duty post, or as some Bible say, at his employment. I tell you, he will place him over everything he owns. Can you imagine if Jesus should take you and give you, place you over everything he owns? Do you know everything that Jesus owns? What do I think about everything he owns? His entire kingdom, exaltation. He's going to put you over everything he owns. You will literally be sitting at his right hand in heaven, so to say. You become like, you know, left and out. That is the promise made to the good and faithful servant for the, for the one who will be faithful, who will be found at their duty post, who will appreciate their exalted position in the vineyard of the Lord and not take the position for granted. Who is that servant among us that Jesus, when he comes, will be so happy with you that he will put you over everything that he owns? Who? Who here can say, I am the one? I pray that I will be the one. Everybody say that. And so, that uh, passage begins by saying, Stay awake because you do not know when your master is coming. Stay awake. You don't know when the master is coming. We talked about that last week, more or less. Not meant that the same thing, more or less, will repeat itself this day. And as long as the passages keep coming, we will keep talking about it because the church knows what it is doing by giving all these passages at this time and repeating and repeating the same thing, so to say, about readiness, being properly dressed, being ready for the banquet, being ready for the master's coming, not leaving your door open for the thief. The thief is the devil. It says, if the owner of the household had known at what time of the night the burglar would come, he would have stayed awake and would not have allowed anyone to break through the wall of his house. Some time ago, somebody was sharing a testimony with me, how she was in her room in the night, not here, those of you that live in town. She was in her room at night. Her door, main door, the door of her, of her room was locked. Her toilet is inside her room. She got up in the night to ease herself, went into the bathroom, into the uh, restroom, within her room, not as if she opened the door, right there inside her room. She went into her room to ease herself, to wash her hands. She said she came out and noticed that the cloth she was hanging on her wardrobe was shaking. The cloth was shaking and she was like, ah, what kind of breeze is blowing this cloth? And the cloth is shaking. She couldn't understand. She went nearer to see why is the cloth she hung on the, in the, on, the, on the wardrobe, why is it moving? Only for a strange man to bring out his head from behind the cloth. And she shouted, Jesus! Blood of Jesus! And the man said, Keep quiet! You want to die? And she shouted the more, Blood of Jesus! Blood of Jesus. Then she realized, but the door is locked. Where did he come in from? Where did he come in from? I want to make the story short because it's a real story. This was just last month. She later realized that the man came in through the window. The window was open. 
There was no butler proof. But she had the door locked. But the window was what? Open. No butler proof. This is what you are talking about. Many of us are like that. We lock one door and leave two open. You know what I mean by that? I'm talking about spiritually now. And we go to bed thinking that the door is locked. But you have left the window open. And you do not know at what hour the thief will come. That is what Jesus is saying. We do not know that if the owner of the household had known at what time of the night the thief will come, he would not have left his door open. Or he would not have left the window open. If that lady I'm talking about had imagined that a thief will come in, she would have locked her window. She would not have left the ladder outside. She would have made sure that there is burglar proof, etc., etc. But we all know that thieves don't knock at the door and say, I'm coming up. The same thing. Death does not knock at the door to say, I'm coming. Nobody knows the hour that that thing called death, which comes to steal away life. You do not know at what time it will come. It does not give notice. It does not say, I'm coming home, so that it's okay, let me get ready. Jesus calls us, first, last week, to be in the correct wedding garment. Because we do not know. When the owner of the banquet will come out to inspect whether we are ready. And you'll be thrown out. That was last week. Today, again, we are being called to do the necessary. Do the necessary. Fasten your belt. Secure all loopholes. Close necessary doors against the thief. That is the devil. Close necessary doors. Don't give the devil the opportunity. Because you don't know when it is going to happen. You don't know when that D-Day will be. We have to stand ready. And if God has given you any particular responsibility, you have a duty to yourself, to yourself even, apart from to God and humanity. They give it to yourself to make sure you are doing what you are supposed to be doing at the right time, in the right place, to the right person. And not only doing it, to be doing it diligently in a way that you earn your past mark and the favor of your master whenever he comes, even if he comes unexpectedly, like the thief comes unexpectedly. Jesus used that stimulus to explain to us that his coming can be at any time. His coming can be at any time. He's not referring to a physical thief. But I use the story of the thief that somebody told me last week, uh, last month, just to give you an example of what the Lord is talking about. In reality, it did happen just last month. Somebody left the window open, no bubbler proof. And then not only that, left a ladder where the thief can find it and climb and enter. Very freely. And so I went into her room. Meanwhile, her front door was locked. All doors were locked. That is how a lot of us leave loopholes. We leave too many loopholes in our lives. While we claim we are doing one thing properly, like locking one door securely, we are leaving another open. You do not know from what angle the thief will come. And you do not know at what hour of the night it will be. Secure, everything securable. What do I mean by that? This is the hour for all of us to examine every aspect of our lives. That's what I mean. Examine every aspect of our lives and see which door needs to be secured. See which one needs a burglar proof, so to say. What do I mean by that? See where you are leaving a loophole. 
that may bring you disaster. Plug everything that is pluggable. I'll give you an example. A lot of us think we are preparing for heaven by going regularly to morning mass. We never miss morning mass, which is very good. But while we are preparing for heaven by never missing morning mass, we are neglecting the poor man on the road. Is it just the poor man on the road? That's even too far. You are neglecting the house help under your roof. That house help that you brought from the village, that small girl that you went to the village to bring to help you with domestic work. She is suffering. You are neglecting. She's not going to school. Your children are going to school. Your children are in private schools. Your house health is in the kitchen. She's about the age of your own children. You are sending your own children to the best schools, even private schools, paying hundreds of thousands. You cannot pay 5,000 for that child to go to even a public school. Just buy her, that's all she needs, free education. Just give her books and table, and she will, she will become literate. No. But your children are paying hundreds of thousands to attend the best schools in the, in the, in the, in the, in the city. But your house help that you brought from the village must stay at home and clean the house and watch the place for your children and never be educated so that the cycle of poverty in her family will forever continue while your children become the rich governors and commissioners and doctors of tomorrow. Those are loopholes. When the master comes, he will ask you. He will ask you. I gave you every rich, all the riches in the world, every opportunity. You use it for yourself and for your children alone. And you marginalize and oppress the child of the poor man, taking her as a slave into your house, using her to service yourself and service your children while they went to school, and she never to move forward. Is that not the same as the story in the Bible that we are reading today? about the one that God entrusted with responsibility and who decided to do what? Begin to eat and drink and enjoy himself while beating the servants, other servants. Beating them, maltreating them. Himself enjoying, eating, drinking to the point of drunkenness and beating the others and not giving them their food at the right time. In other words, not giving them what they deserve. Oppression. Is what it is talking about. The capitalist behavior is what it is talking about. Monopoly of all the good things that God gives us is what it's talking about. It's talking about selfishness. It's talking about greed. That's what the reading is about. Being greedy, being selfish, being centered on oneself while marginalizing maltreating and oppressing others, whom we are supposed to be looking after and be giving what they deserve. Because what, after all, the, 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 the things that were in the house were not his own. He didn't buy them. It was given by the master to be for the common good. Why did he monopolize and at the same time beat the servants who are supposed to be fed? Many of us are like that. We believe that the riches that God gives us is for ourselves. But we forget that it is God's own. It belongs to God. And that it is meant to be shared. And we whom he entrusted it into our hands are only custodians. We are only custodians of the wealth, the riches, the goodies, the good things of God. And we are meant to share, divide, give others. Share it out. The Lord did not say you should not eat. Eat, give others. Enjoy, make sure others are enjoying. You are only in charge of the household. The house is not yours. God only puts you in charge. It's not yours. The servants are God as his own. The master, this master, the servants, those servants you are meant to look after, are not your servants. They are the master servants. You also are a servant. Just that you are the one the master trusted. 
and put all those things in your hands that you may give it out and be sure that everybody has. That is how it is with us in life. As we normally sing in that song, all I have is given to me by the Lord. All I have is given to me by the Lord. If you know that everything you have is given to you by the Lord, why are you holding it? Why are you alone sitting on it? Why are you getting drunk and overeating on what belongs to the Master? But you tell us it is given to you by the Lord. It's given to you by the Lord that you may give to others. God gives us that we give out. There are many ways we can see ourselves in the position of that nonsense servant. The Lord trusted him so much. He became a disappointment to his master. Many of us are so trusted by the Lord in this world. Sent into the Lord, into the world by God with a lot of trust and, conf and confidence that we do and do this for him and do this for others and help our neighbors and do this and do that. Are we doing so? Or we now came into the world and turned into ourselves, became wicked to our neighbors, became selfish, became gluttons, eating until our stomachs are big and pot bellied. You see a lot of people with pot belly. Either they are drinking too much or eating too much. Getting so fat you can hardly see their neck. There are many people who are neckless nowadays. You can't see their necks. Too much fat. And somebody beside them is starving. Even not beside. Somebody under their, room, under their nose is starving. A houseboy or a housemaid whom they have gone and acquired and turned into a slave. Look at it. A slave. A servant making another person a servant. You are a servant too. Your master only gave you authority. Then you now try to start treating the other fellow servants as your servants. If not, why is he beating them? Why is he, why is he maltreating them? And himself getting drunk. Because he's drinking the drink of others. That's why he can get drunk. If you share this out equally, there will be no room for drunkenness. You will not have too much to drink. And be getting drunk. But because he decided to put everything under his himself and forget others, that no wonder he can get drunk, committing sin. We should all look into our lives and see. In our journey to the kingdom, where are we with it? That's just what it's about. It's not just a matter of whether you are eating or not eating. It's a question of self-examination. As we journey towards this promised land, everybody wants to get there. Everybody wants to get to heaven. Are we ready? Are we preparing? It's as if the Lord is just sending these passages to us day in, day out. Remember that in June or July we started with looking at those things that Jesus said. Unless you do this, you cannot enter the kingdom. Unless you do that, you will not enter the kingdom. Unless you become like little children. Unless, unless your virtues go ahead higher than that of the Pharisees and the scribes. We were looking at all that unless. We were searching for it in various Gospels. Luke, Matthew, John. Then, the weekday um, uh, readings. Now, for they're bringing it even to us. We don't even have to look anymore. Today, we didn't have to look into it, search for it in any gospel. It's there. In today's reading for, you know, the reading for the day. Shouting it out. This is what will make you be thrown into the place. Yeah, there will be in a national state. In other words, you cannot enter the kingdom. Unless you become a good servant. Unless you become a worthy servant. Unless you fulfill the trust and the confidence the master has in you by making you who you are and what you are in life. Yes. Unless you fulfill that confidence that made the master to exalt you, to make you who you are and what you are today. A realization I did not make myself what I am. I did not give myself the wealth I have. It is given to me as a custodian to share with others with fellow human beings. All of us are nothing but mere servants. So we must all throw away this capitalist behavior. We must all throw away this nonsense hoarding. We must all throw away this spirit that is in us, that is so selfish and always thinking of oneself alone. We need to throw away 
whatever it is in us that make us not to see others in their need. We must throw away whatever it is that is in us that blindfold us and make us to think like the unworthy servants. Oh, my master is late in coming. Let me enjoy myself. Many of us are like that. Just because you are still alive at 70 or 80, you think, ah, yes, master is delaying. Let me first of all enjoy. How do you call it? You say, let me enjoy the fruit of my labor. You don't know what you say. Hello? I hear many people who say it. Yeah, I will enjoy the fruit of my labor. Nobody will stop me from enjoying the fruit of my labor before I die. Fruit of your labor. Indeed, fruit of your labor. The poor man did not labor. That's why he has nothing to eat. That's what you think. There are many who labor. Labor, labor, labor. Even more than you. Who sat in an air-conditioned office. I'm calling it labor. There are some who labor on the streets. Carrying block, carrying cement. Some labor cleaning gutters. And they only get five dollars a day. There are people that labor more than you, working hard in the farm. Working hard in the heat of the sun while you are in an air conditioned office signing checks and writing letters. Very easy. When you retire, you get gratuity pension, big salary. The one laboring the sun, working and farming. And maybe after farming fire, disaster or something, got into the farm and raises the farm down and the person goes bankrupt. It's not because he did not labor. That's not his fault. That's not his fault. As Jesus said to them, those men that the tower fell on and destroyed, do you think that they were more, they were greater sinners than others? No. When disaster befalls a man, some calamity, it can make a person bankrupt. Or some illness, long-standing illness, they spend all the money they have to save life. The whole family goes bankrupt. They're not even be able to go to school. So it's not that they did not labor. So those of us who sit down there telling ourselves when you are rich and you have plenty, you tell yourself, I beg, let me enjoy the fruit of my labor. And you cannot see others in need because you believe it's your labor. You labored for it, you're entitled to it, you should eat it and enjoy. The master has warned you. When he comes, when he comes, he will throw you out. Yet there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's when you vomit all the things that you enjoy for not seeing others in need. And counting what was given to you in custody to give others as your fruit of your labor. It is the fruit of my labor. I worked for it. Did the others not work? I know that there are some who just loaf around, busy doing nothing. But there are some who, despite hard work, are really, really poor. And when you look at the extent to which they labor, you will know that you have not labored as much as they did. So sitting down there in a selfish mood and telling yourself, let me enjoy the fruit of my labor, and you cannot see others in need, and how to reach out. Well, I don't need to tell you more. Scripture has said it all. You will find yourself on that great day. Yet there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. While the poor man, like, Le like Lazarus, will find himself in the bosom of Abraham. And he will be in the world, world not begging for a drop of water. The water you never gave the poor because you were enjoying the fruit of your labor. In quotes, so called labor. The Almighty God help us. We are warned. Stay awake. You do not know the hour of the night that the thief will come. If you know all the open doors, when I say open doors that you have left in your life, that is to say, all those areas that require action before it is too late, go and do something about them. It may not even be selfishness or greed that is making you not ready. That will make the, the thief to come and see wide open door to enter. It may not be selfishness or greed. It may be other sins and weaknesses that are leaving the door open for the thief. 
It may be other weaknesses. Talking too much can be part of it. Abuse of the tongue. Using your tongue anyhow. Abuse of the eyes. Laziness. Refusal to repent. Refusal to accept God into your life. It could be fornication, adultery, promiscuity of one kind or the other. It may be stealing. It may be telling lies that is your own open door. Ways of allowing the enemy into our lives. We have to plug them. Each one know, each one will know what is your own. And I know that the various ways we leave the door open. Very, very different. One to another, it is different. Then the various ways in which we behave like the foolish servant is also different from one person to another. It differs from one to another. But only each one, if you really want to be sincere, can check yourself and discover in what way do I fit into this stupid servant. Who thought the master was delaying and began to do whatever he liked? And that whatever he liked, Jesus told us about the man who started eating and drinking, beating the other servants. We have talked about that. But can there be other ways that you too are behaving stupidly as a servant and a custodian of God's graces? It can be different one to another. It may not necessarily be a question of eating, gluttony and drunkenness. It could be something else. It could be something else. Maybe somebody needs your attention, for instance, and they come to you, knock at your door for assistance. It's like, don't disturb me, please, go away. I have my children to look after. Don't disturb me. Lack of charity of various kinds. That's what we're talking about. Simply just lacking in charity in one way or the other. In various ways. It could be closing from mass and refusing to, or from prayer, refusing to give a ride to somebody else who has to trek on the road. Because you feel the car is yours. And you don't owe anybody any obligation of giving them a ride. And you are going the same direction, but you cannot help. Because you don't see the car as being something God gave you to use for others. You see it as, it's my own. For me alone, always. While others are suffering. That's what we are talking about. There are many ways we can be like that servant. And you tell yourself, uh, the master is not coming yet. Before he comes, I will adjust. If you knew he will come tomorrow, you will run out and do all the charity in the world today. Am I right? Am I correct? If you should know that you are going to die tomorrow, will you not run out and do all the good things you can do today? Hoping to use your good works to bribe the Lord. You want to do bribery too, even for the kingdom. Bribery and corruption. You can't, you can't bribe God. Because the Lord will look at you and say, all these days you didn't do it, just because I told you I'm coming tomorrow. The real charity in our lives comes from now. We don't know the hour when the master is coming. So we are doing what we have to do for love of God and for love of neighbor. And for the salvation of our souls. We just do it. He may not come for you for another 50 years. You may still have another 50 years to live. You may have another 60 years to live. You just keep doing it every day, every day while waiting. Not the one that you want and you want to jump and do last minute because you've just been told that your life is in danger, you are going to die next week. Then you start jumping and doing it. You can't cheat God and you can't deceive Him. May God not allow us to procrastinate our salvation. May God save us from procrastinating our readiness. 
May God save us from trying to think we can cheat God by playing a, a game of chairs with him. Or a game of playing hanky panky. If I know he's coming, I will be prepared. He's not coming yet, so let me do what I like. That's a game. You can't play games with God. Because what you do every single day is being written down for you in heaven. What you do every day is being written down. And he is seeing you, he's a God of the now, a God who lives in the present. And what you do now, today, is there. Written down for you in the book of life. I pray that in our book of life, they are not writing for us the one that will make us be thrown out. So yet they are the weeping and grinding of teeth. And that what God is seeing in us will be something that will make him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. And then place you over everything he has, as he has promised to do in the parable. May he find us ready, as we said last week, in the correct garment of righteousness, holiness, all set for the banquet. Realizing that we didn't merit to be there, but that he, he invited us freely of his own free will, even when we had no merit. Let us be ready and dressed in appreciation for the free gift of an eternal banquet that is waiting for us. Let us find ourselves ready and always be at our duty post, realizing that he trusted us by even calling us to serve him at all. The call to serve is a sign that he trusts us, to even call us to be his servant at all. It's a sign of love and trust. Let us not betray that trust by never being where we should be. Many of us are just not where we should be. Many of us are just not at our duty post. Many of us are neglecting our duty as Christians, as servants. And we forget that not only are we failing ourselves, we are disappointing our God, who has put so much trust and confidence in us by calling us and choosing us to be his servant and to look after his household. That household can be your family, your children, your place of work that he has put you in charge. It can be the school where you are the head teacher. It can be the hospital where you are the CMD or the chief nursing officer. It can be the bank where you are the bank manager with other people under you. It can be the church where you are the parish priest. It can be the wider church where you are the bishop or archbishop. It can be your immediate larger family where you are the firstborn and everybody else is looking up to you. But it can be your little unit family, where you are the mother or the father, or you are the other first son, first daughter, or it can be any group where you find yourself the advantaged one, let me put it that way, where you find yourself at an advantage over others, you have an advantage position, maybe you are nearer to the top management than others. And you can use your position to pass the good things that the management has to the younger other staff and workers. It can be any, even in school, it can be you, the head girl of the school, the senior prefect. Don't begin to keep the things that the school authorities are giving you for yourself and then align others to suffer and you are not helping them. It could even just be that you are more intelligent than others. God has given you that, that you may use it to help others who are not as intelligent. Show them how to do that mathematics they don't know. Instead of using it for yourself, gloating over it, enjoying that others are failing you alone are passing. There are many ways we can take advantage of what God has put in our care and custody. 
and use it selfishly and forget the weaker ones around us. All those ways are the ways that we will be behaving. If we do that, we will be behaving like this servant, who took advantage of everything entrusted to him, kept it for himself, enjoyed it to the point of drunkenness, and left others without. Even our intelligence and our talents may be the things God has put in our custody that we share our talents with others. If you know how to sew, teach others how to sew. If you know how to knit, teach others how to knit. There are so many things we can share. It's not just food and drink. Whatever God gives us, we are meant to share it, that others too may have and become better persons. Let us not hold. Let us not accumulate things for ourselves. Let us learn to share and share in love and not use our talents, our gifts, our wealth, our position to victimize others, to suffer others. Because when the master comes, it will not go down well. He is the giver of all good things, the beginning and the end, the author, the finisher of our lives. Accountability. He expects us to account for our various positions in life. He expects us to account for the good things He has given us in life. He expects us to account for the talents He has given us and how we have shared it with the less privileged around us and under us. Accountability day is what this passage is talking about. The day for accountability is coming. Will the master be happy with you or will he throw you into everlasting punishment where you will suffer for what you have enjoyed without sharing? the words little as I have spoken find a place in all our hearts and bring God the necessary transformation and readiness for the kingdom which this passage calls for through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Let us rise up now and put our petitions before the Lord all that we want God to do for us. One day Jesus was going down the road, a blind beggar was sitting there by the roadside. And the blind beggar was shouting, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And people told that blind man, keep quiet, don't disturb the master. Instead, he shouted louder, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. He so shouted that Jesus said, bring him to me. They called the blind man, the Lord said he should come. He quickly threw off his begging garment and cloak and ran to the master. Standing in front of Jesus, the Lord looked at him with mercy and love and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The man quickly said what was most important to him. Lord, that I may see. He received his sight that day. Two things there. One was his persistence. He called with persistence. Even when they were telling him to keep quiet, he was calling louder. Persistence. 
perseverance in us. Two, trust. He believed that if Jesus will just hear him, something will happen and change his blindness to sight. And his darkness will become light. So he had confidence. Because he had confidence, nobody could stop him from reaching out to the master for help. The third point was that he threw off his cloak, ran in a haste, excitedly, anxiously, with a lot of, um, how would I put it, you know, eagerness to meet the master, knowing that if he gets to Jesus, that would be the end of his problem. Jesus was for him the only solution and the last bus stop. And it became so. Because when he got there, I am sure he never went back to beg in that place again. He was never a beggar anymore. He could see. His life changed. Another thing is that Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? If I'm the, some of us, if we are the ones, we will start asking for, I want to be a rich man so that I will never beg again. You will capitalize on the opportunity of being asked, what do you want me to do for you? We begin to ask for lofty things. Instead of that, which is most important to us. Bartimaeus was a beggar. When Master said, what do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus hit where it was paining him. He didn't start asking for mansions and for wealth. He simply said, just let me see, that I may see. That is enough for me. Let us learn the simplicity of the request of Bartimaeus, the blind beggar. His prayer was very simple. One sentence. Lord, that I may see. He didn't make a long list of unnecessary superfluous things just because they said, what do you want me to do for you? Unless the master himself tells you, tell me everything in this life you want. Okay, you can make a list. Today, I am saying, what do you want my Lord to do for you? He expects you to say it with the simplicity and transparency of Bartimaeus. Lord, that I may see, or Lord, that I may be healed, or Lord, deliver me from the powers of darkness, or Lord, lift me up to your glory, or Lord, bring me to eternal life with you in heaven on my last day, or Lord, give me good health and long life, or Lord, give me wisdom. You know, let us pray with the simplicity and the faith of Bartimaeus. You have come before the Lord. You left home. You traveled to be here. Paid transport fare. Because you believe, I, I hope, like Bartimaeus, that when you get to the presence of Jesus, the solution is there. You believe that when you get to his presence, you have reached the last bus stop. If not, you will not travel all the way to this far distant place. With the cost of transportation, as I have heard, that has doubled and tripled because of COVID-19. See, you pay that transport fare, 
to come to this very, very far interior place. You must have faith. So I'm not questioning your faith at all. You certainly have the faith of Bartimaeus. All that remains now is respond to the master's question. Jesus says, and I, his tiny hand made, speak in Christ, with Christ, through Christ. My people, what do you want God to do for you? Open your mouth now and say it. He is waiting to hear you. And remember that he who hears you is one who has all the treasury of anything any human being can ever request. And he is able to do it. So let there be no doubt in your mind. Whatever that request may be, put it out before the master. He has not given you any limitation. He said, what do you want me to do? What an opportunity. Don't waste it. We make all our prayers through Christ our Lord. Almighty God and Father, we thank you because you always hear us. Father, we thank you because you have heard us again. You who called us to come into your presence, like you called Bartimaeus, and said, bring him here. We thank you for bringing us here, that you will hear us and answer us. We are grateful because we know that you who brought us to this compound, to have this encounter with you, like Bartimaeus, you have answered us. You have seen us in our needs. You have asked us what we want. We have told you with trust and confidence what we want. And we know that as you did it for Bartimaeus instantly, so you have answered us instantly. Oh God, who lives in the present, ever in the now. For you, there is no tomorrow, no yesterday. Omnipresent God, ever attentive God, and at the same time, omnipotent God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For the privilege of calling us like Bartimaeus. He said, bring him. You brought us just to talk to you face to face. Like Bartimaeus looked at you, you looked at him. And you said, what do you want? Thank you for this privilege of inviting us to meet you and to ask us what we want. That we use our mouth to say to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the Omnipotent, the one who has the power to do it, the one who has the power to heal, the one who can take care of all our desires, is asking us, what do you want? Oh, Chuku, Ezen, Ezen, Okao, man, thank you, thank you, thank you, what a privilege, what a privilege, what a privilege that you can call us to come, just so that you will hear us, and you can tell us, Say what you want. Oh, Father, we are grateful. For your love for us is so great. We can't express it. We can't tell it all. We can't fathom it. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you because you always hear us. Thank you because I know you have heard us again. And so we sing. We are grateful, oh Lord. We are grateful, O oh Lord, for what you have done for us. Hallelujah. We are grateful, O oh Lord. We are grateful, O oh Lord. We are grateful, O oh Lord, our God, for every prayer you have answered. Hallelujah. We are grateful, O oh Lord. 
Now, if anybody is sick, touch where your sickness is and receive your healing immediately. In the name of Jesus the Lord and by the power of God the Most High, the author of life, the giver of life, and the healer. As I lift this crucifix, the sign of Christ crucified, by whose wounds we are healed, by whose death on the cross we have life eternal, and have life in its fullness. I call upon each one that is sick to look upon Jesus crucified. Behold the cross of the Lord. Flee ye bands of enemies. Flee all spirits of infirmity. Be gone, Satan. Be gone, whatever is the cause of the problem or the sickness. From its very origin, be uprooted and cast into the everlasting fire. I think Christ with Christ through Christ I pronounce. Be well! Ad majorem gloriam Dei. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our healer, and our Savior. Amen. It is God's healing power that goes forth from my mouth as I hereby proclaim everyone that is sick completely well who is here or connected to us in spirit for the glory of God, the Most High, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is done. In Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus loves you and wants to heal you. You have said Amen. And you are healed. Begin to give thanks to God. He touched my body, he touched my soul. Jesus touched my spirit and made me well. He touched my body, he touched my soul. Jesus touched my spirit and made me well. He touched my body, he touched my soul, Jesus touched my spirit and made me whole. Jesus touched my spirit and made me whole. You have touched my body, you touched my soul. Lord, you touched my spirit, you have made me well. You have touched my spirit and made me well. You have touched my body and made me whole. Lord, you 
refresh my body and now I'm well. Lord, you touch my body and now I'm well. Praise the Lord. We go to the next level. All those who seek deliverance. You want the Lord to set you free from any form of spiritual possession by an unclean spirit or freedom from obsessive spirits, attacks, nightmares, bad dreams, any curses, covenants you want to break. Everything contrary to God that you want to break from. All that is not of God that you want to give up. This is the hour of the Lord's deliverance. Come to the throne of grace. There is a power above all powers. We have the God above all gods. In fact, apart from Him, there is none other. We have Yahweh El Shaddai, the God who is the Almighty on our side. Before Him we stand. Sinful though we be, we are sorrowful because we are sorry for our sins. Are we not? Are we not so sorry for our sins? And we want to give them up. We want to be set free from the bondage of sin and slavery to the devil. We want to be God's perfect children henceforth. To break away from the bondage of the evil one, the bondage of sin, lying, stealing, fornication, all those things that God does not want to see in us. We want to break away from them now. We want the Savior, Jesus Christ, Son of God, who died on the cross to save us, to bring down his salvific power and set us free and draw us into himself and tie us to himself forever hereafter that we never go back to those things from which he is about to deliver us now for the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. So everyone standing there, if you know what you want to break from, what you want God to deliver you from, open your mouth and say it. Because for each one it is different. It may be spirit of lies, deceit, pride, anger, impatience. It may be slavery to fornication, gluttony, selfishness. It may be a real spiritual attack, obsession or possession. It may be bondage to sin you want to get rid of. Whatever it is, it may be spirit of poverty, setback, barrenness, that you want God to get rid of for you. Remember, only God can set a person free. But to set you free, He requires your cooperation. He requires you to run to Him and say, Jesus, save me. That's what He wants to hear. He always likes to hear that statement. Jesus, save me. You are the one to tell Him what area of your life requires his intervention now? You are the one to tell him what area of your life requires deliverance, his delivering power. He's always stretching his hands to deliver. But we must tell him, Jesus, save me. I'm afraid of this. I'm worried about this. This is where it is. Jesus, save me. Not that he does not know, but he wants us to call him. I will tell you why I say that. Jesus was in the boat with his apostles. They were traveling. Water began to enter the boat as it was tempestuous. Jesus was in the boat. And the boat was tossing forth and back, sideways, forward, and the apostles were struggling, struggling, struggling. Jesus was there. He kept quiet. Until they went to him to say, Master! 
Do you not care that you are perishing? That the boat was going first, back, sideways, storm, he was there. They, it was when they came to him to say, Master, I said, Lord, do something. Immediately, immediately, Jesus got up. And he commanded the storm to cease. And he said, Peace be still. Immediately, the wind, the waves, everything obeyed him. And it was still. And they said to safety. The Lord is in our midst. The Lord is in our lives. He loves us. He's in our boat, the boat of each person's life. Jesus is in the boat of our lives. You may think he's sleeping. He's not sleeping. That same pastor's boat, disturbing your night, giving you insomnia, lack of sleep, restless night, whatever you are struggling to overcome that is not working, like a boat tossed forth and back, you are struggling with it, struggling with it, and you are not able to steady it by yourself, run to a Jesus, he is in the boat. Go to him and say, Master, save me, don't let me perish. Don't let me sink beneath the waves. And watch the Master stand up for you. Watch Jesus stand up for you. Jesus is going to stand up for me. He's going to stand up for you now. I have called him to arise. That my boat is tempest tall. He is arising with healing in his hands, with power in his hands, with deliverance in his hands, with the power to calm the troubled sea, with the power to steady the boat. The Lord arises to our aid. Oh God, arise. Oh God, arise. Let your enemies be scattered. Let those that hate us flee. Our smoke is driven away. Drive the evil one away from us. Our smoke may be for fire. So let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Behold the cross of the Lord. Flee ye bands of enemies. For the land of heaven of Judah, the offspring of David, Jesus Christ has conquered. Jesus Christ has a reason to save us. No more nightmares, no more bad dreams. We have overcome you, spirit of fornication, spirit of lies, in the name of Jesus the Lord. We have overcome all the spirits of setback and spirits of despair that make us not to want, not to lean on our God. We have overcome in the name of Jesus. Our deliverer has risen to deliver us. The Savior Jesus has come to our rescue. For his name is Savior. His name is Rescuer. He is the Yeshua of God. In the name of Jesus. In the holy name of Jesus. The king of the battlefield has arisen to fight our battles. And we have conquered the devil and his agents. In whatever form they exist. In the name of Jesus, we have overcome the obstacles. For Jesus has a reason to lead the way. And where the Lord lives, there can never be a roadblock. In the name of Jesus, he has come to open the doors that are closed. In the name of Jesus, in his glory, he has lifted the banner of salvation over us. And we are saved from all harm and danger, from every evil, from COVID, from whatever the pestilence and the plague may be from whatever the emotional traumas may be. The land of tribe of Judah, the offspring of David, Jesus has come to our rescue. We shall soar high and above all that hitherto kept us at bound and blinded us. The blindfold us are removed. We shall see. And we shall walk in the light of God forever and ever. Asleep or awake, our footsteps shall never stray into the 
cost of the wicked and the cost of Satan. In the name of Jesus, as we are away, we shall walk in the light of the Most High God. From now on, we belong to God. As in Christ, with Christ, through Christ. Everybody look up. In Christ, with Christ, through Christ, I say, Be gone, Satan! Be gone, all unclean spirit! Be gone, every bondage! Be gone, whatever tied us down! Be gone, all blindfolders! Be gone from us! Be gone from our spirit! Be gone from our souls! Be gone from our lives! Be gone from our situations! Be gone from our children! Be gone from our families! Be gone from our homes! Be gone from our businesses! Be gone from our studies! Be gone from every situation and circumstance of our lives! In the name of Jesus Christ the Lord! In the holy name of Jesus, we hereby declare that we belong to God and are for God in life and in death, in spirit and in body. Asleep or awake, we belong to the Most High God. We consecrate ourselves through Christ, in Christ with Christ, to the Most Holy Trinity, God the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost, the Creator of heaven and earth, to Him we belong, in Him we live and move and have our being. Be gone, spirit of sorrow. Be gone, spirit of grief. Be gone, spirit of sadness. Be gone, all disturbing spirits. Be gone, everything contrary to God in the name of Jesus the Lord. Be gone, all that is contrary to the Most High God in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, be gone, every feeling, every feeling of hatred, malice, envy, whatever God detests, be gone in the name of Jesus. Be gone from our hearts. Be gone from our minds. Be gone from our dreams. Be gone, you witches and wizards. Be gone, Oshe, Aje, whatever your names may be. Be gone, part of cult. Be gone, all cultic spirits. Be gone, all cultic and covenants. We break away from you. We turn to God and attach ourselves to God in spirit, in soul, in body. Our innermost being. We live to God Almighty for His anointing. That now and always, in spirit, soul, body, our innermost being belongs to God. We call upon the Holy Spirit to come and inhabit us now and take complete possession of our souls, of our mind, our intellect, our, our will, our dreams, our liberty, our freedom. Holy Spirit, we consecrate ourselves to the Holy Spirit of God. We dedicate ourselves to the Holy Spirit of God. We dedicate our dreams, our night, our sleeping, our waking to the Most High God. We dedicate our work, everything we are and will ever be, to the Holy Spirit of the Living God. To inhabit, to direct, to control, now and always. Unto the glory of God the Most High. For the salvation of our souls, which Jesus has already worked for us. We attach ourselves to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and His Most Holy and Precious Name. We cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus Christ. We cover our spirit with the blood of Jesus Christ. We cover our souls with the blood of Jesus Christ the Lord. We cover our sleeping and our waking with the blood of Jesus Christ. We cover our work activities day by day with the blood of Jesus Christ. We cover our families with the blood of Jesus Christ. We cover our homes, our shelter, all our, all our thoughts, imaginations, sight, hearing, with the blood of Jesus Christ. We cover our thinking and our intelligence with the blood of Jesus Christ. We cover our reasoning with the blood of Jesus Christ. We cover every sense of activity in our brain and our thoughts with the powerful blood of Jesus Christ. All is consecrated to the Most High God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by the working of the Holy Spirit, we claim new life in God. We claim a forward motion in God. We claim a growth in holiness in God. In the holy name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, who spoke and said in the Old Testament, I take out of you the heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Father, take away the stone in us. Take away the heart of stone. Give us a heart of flesh that you can write upon. Write your word in us and fulfill it in our lives. In the name of Jesus. To us. All for thee, O Most High God, all for thee. 
through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of Jesus, all for thee, O Most High God, Most Holy Trinity, now, through life, in death, and in eternity. Amen! In Jesus' mighty name, Amen! Hallelujah! Now you say your amen seven times. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Now begin to clap for Jesus as we shout hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Your hands for the Lord, your voices shout the hallelujah for this great deliverance, for this great salvation, for this great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that everything negative in us is done, and all that is good and worthy, holy and honorable before God has entered, and that our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit, and all that hitherto offended God is cast out in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus by the power of Jesus Christ, the author of life, the giver of life, the only one who can renew us, the only one who can transform us, the only one who can really set us free, because that is what he came for, to free us from the devil and usher us into the kingdom of God the Father. He has done that again, and he always do for us, and we believe that henceforth, no power of darkness can overtake us, because we have dedicated ourselves to Christ, to the Father, to the Holy Spirit. In God we are saved. Anything given to God is well taken care of. We have given all to God. We have said purpose to us, all for thee, O Most High God, in life, in death, and in eternity, now and forever. And it is so, because God desires it, and we have desired it. We know that in Christ it is yes and amen. We belong to God. Everybody say, I belong to God. I am, for God. I am for God. All for thee, O Most High God. God. In life, in, life. in, death, in death, and in eternity. And in eternity. Amen, so be it. Amen. We now call upon our Mother Mary, Mediatrix of Graces, to intercede for us. She, whom Jesus gave to us from the cross of Calvary, when he said to John, Behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. Mother, we like John, the evangelist, turn to you, we call you mother. The same you that Jesus our Lord called mother. We, his followers, turn to you and call you mother. Mother Mary, mother of Jesus Christ, mediatrix of all graces, come and intercede for us that this covenant with, that we have entered into with God to be his and his alone in life, in death, and in eternity, that you will keep it for us, praying that it will happen, and that it will be so, now and always. Whether we are praying or not, Mother, please put these petitions before God Most High, that nothing will ever separate us from God again. In Jesus' name, as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for all sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Immaculate heart of Mary, mediatrix of all graces. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Pray for us, sinners, and the earth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the 
Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Lord our God, we pray. Our help is the name of the Lord our God. May Almighty God bless you, each one. Remain with us, go home with us, bring God lasting peace and joy. A joy that the world can never take from us. Keep us united with God the Father as we have entered into a renewed covenant with Him to be His and His alone forever. Protect us from all harm and danger. Shield us from robbers and enemies. May Almighty God deliver us from schism and heresy. Save us from sickness and pain. Save us from COVID-19 and from any other plagues and disasters. Save us, Lord, from accidents and dangers. Save us from robbers and enemies. Save us from kidnappers. And whatever it is that is happening out there in the world. Father, save us from all evil. Deliver us for the glory of your name. In peace for our coming. In greater peace be each one's going to their various homes. And by the power of God, in peace and joy and in gladness, we shall come together again to worship the living and the true God. Who is God? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So, now, anybody who has a testimony, who got their healing, or whatever, feel free to come out and give it. And once you give it, you are free to go. How many people received their healing? Maybe you can just raise your hands. Can the ushers please count all those who, who got their healing? Please count right. Can some people join to count? All those who got their healing, raise your hand and keep your hand raised until it is totally counted, please. counting should start from the front. Start somewhere. They are missing people. Can somebody count correctly from the front? Instead of the two ushers for people following each other. Please keep your hands raised. Raise it and give the glory to God by raising your hand. All those who got their healing and their deliverance. If you got your healing and you know the Lord has set you free and you felt it as the prayer was going on and you are sure, please keep your hand raised. To glorify God. And let God who sees your hand raised. Make your healing to be permanent in Jesus name. Amen. Let God who sees your hand waving to the sky. Saying thank you Lord for my healing. May he make your healing and your setting free permanent in Jesus name. Amen. What God has removed will never come back in Jesus name. Amen. And the graces. And the healing that God has given, nobody can take away in Jesus' name. Amen. It will be permanent. All that God has given to us, good, worthy, honorable, shall be permanent in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many? 66 plus, plus, eight. plus 8 on this side. 66 plus 8. There are some people on this side. 74. 74. Your hands for the living God. We are saying thank you, Jesus. We are saying thank you, Jesus. For your goodness, thank you, Jesus. For your kindness, thank you, Jesus Christ. For your healing, we say thank you. 